Hello, today is December 23rd, 2008, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott, and we are privileged today to have with us Gary Donato. Wake welcome, Gary. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Joan. Uh, may I ask you where you were born and when? I was born in Berlin, New Hampshire. Um, 20 May 1953. And you are currently living? I'm living in Holliston, Mass. right now. And your marital status? Um, divorced and then remarried. Not the same woman? No. Okay. No. I and was married for 27 years and then we, we got divorced and then um, found this wonderful woman and uh, we remarried about two years ago and settled into uh, Holliston, Mass. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And you have children? I have three of my own. They're grown. Uh, my oldest is Kara. She's 36. 36, yes, 36. Um, then Angela, who's 34. And my son, Frank, who's, uh, he'll be 30 here, uh, January 9th. And I have two stepchildren, Jenny, who's 13, and Jesse, who's 10. So I play dad all over again, which is great. That's wonderful. Where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military in really Groton, Connecticut, but our entrance uh, location was in New Haven, Connecticut. And that was in um, June, end of June 1972. Um, but I entered on a delayed entry program. Um, so I actually entered in uh, August, August 14th of uh, 1972. Why did you join at that time? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I had gotten married in uh, July of 72, which is why I asked for the delayed entry. I, I had spent two years in college, University of Connecticut. Um, even though I was an A student in high school, I found that I was less than an A student in college. Um, wasn't doing very well. Bored or anything else. I had this wanderlust from an early age, uh, but then I got married, and I said, and I want to get, I want to be married, I want to finish college, I want to travel, what better way to do it than to join the military? And in 1972, we were still in the Vietnam War, and I had this, for some reason, I, I had this really solid twinge of patriotism. I still can't explain it to this day. And uh, I knew I was going to join the military. It was just now a matter of which one, which branch. And which branch was it? It was the Navy. Why? Um, I had researched uh, all of them. Uh, my, my future father-in-law, this was back in May, June time period, my future father-in-law was a Navy man. And he took me down to the submarine base in New London, Connecticut. And uh, I wasn't really thrilled with being on submarines. Uh, but I found the life fascinating, and um, when I talked to all the recruiters, I told them, and I talked to Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, and I asked them, I said, I want three things. One, I want to travel. Uh, two, I want to learn mechanics, because I was not one of those gearheads in high school. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids, all, the guys always working on cars and stuff. And That wasn't you? That wasn't me. Definitely not. And so I, I was always embarrassed by the fact that I didn't know mechanics. And so I told all the branches I want to learn mechanics. So I want to travel. I want to make some pretty good money. I want to work on my education. And I want to learn mechanics. And the only one who could guarantee me all that was the Navy. And so I said, all right, since you can guarantee me all this in writing, um, I'll take it. Now, you wanted to travel. You're a newlywed. How did your wife feel about that? She loved the idea. Okay. Absolutely loved it. She was a Navy brat, uh, self-proclaimed uh, Navy brat. Um, and she was more than happy to get out of uh, Lisbon, Connecticut, which is a small town just north of New London. And uh, she says, if we can travel, and as long as we're going to work this career together, uh, and we travel, then I'm all for it. So she was behind it 110%. She was all for it. 
Did any family or friends join at that time, or did they, any of your friends from high school join out of high school? No, I had already uh, graduated high school in 1970. Right. Um, so I was in college for two years, and all my college buddies were thought I was crazy. Um, when you graduated from high school, do any of your high school buddies go on to service? We had one guy uh, who was drafted. He was a little bit older. He had stayed back like three times. <laughs> in elementary school, and uh, he was drafted. Instead of saying that he was going to stay in high school, he ended up joining the Army, and um, he went over to Vietnam. Uh, this was 1970, and uh, he was there maybe two weeks and was shot. And so we had a full page uh, in our yearbook that was dedicated to him. So he was only there for a couple of weeks. Oh, that's terrible. Um, yeah. But he's the only one that in my high school class um, who actually signed up either during high school or right after high school. So two years later, your friends think you're crazy. They and thought you I was insane. Up. And where were you sent when you first went in, which you said was August of 72? August 72. Um, since I was in the Navy, uh, they were either going to send me to San Diego or Great Lakes, Illinois. And based upon my, at the time, they were ASVAB tests, which are Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Tests. That's what I'm surprised I even remember that. Um, based upon the ASVAB test, I ranked very high in math and physics. And so, unbeknownst to me, my recruiter signed me on to the nuclear power program. And all recruits at the time who were going to nuclear power went to Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, and because I wanted to be a machinist, gearhead, um, the, the machinist mate school was also in Chicago. So I ended up going to Great Lakes, Illinois um, for basic training. What was it like for you? Do you remember? It was kind of weird. Um, I had not been in that kind of an environment before. And uh, we, we showed up. Uh, on the bus, because we took a bus out to Chicago, uh, showed up on the bus, and it was uh, very late at night. It was like about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. I was exhausted. Everybody on the bus was exhausted. And as soon as we get off the bus, it was straight out of a movie. It was this, this uh, drill sergeant screaming and yelling at us and telling us to get in line and then laughing at us because we had long hair. This is 1972, so he had the full head of hair. And, some of the blacks um, had afros, and, and the drill sergeant was just laughing at us. And then he segregated us into the blacks and the whites, which I thought was kind of surprising. Here it was 1972. Um, the blacks went to a, a white building with a big black stripe on it, and uh, the rest of us went into these uh, white buildings, and we just, it was a huge building. Um, three floors, and on our floor, I was on the third floor. Uh, most of the windows were broken out, and uh, there were 85 cots in there, and we, we just scrambled for a cot, um, got to bed, and they woke us up at 4 o'clock the next morning uh, for drill, um, uniform, uh, supplies, and um, Haircuts. I was going to say, with all those afros, they're going to have to be haircuts, haircuts right? Six o'clock in the morning, right after breakfast, uh, we had this great breakfast. I thought this was this was great, nice breakfast. Um, but uh, then we went in for haircuts, and they said, uh, you know, it was uh, it was kind of funny, you know. They they said, well, what, what kind of what kind of haircut do you want, you know? And some guys were saying a little off the top, and I said, I don't care, because I knew they were just going to shave it off anyway. So that's what they did. They just shaved it right off. And then we went into this long uh, hallway and they said, all right, take off all your clothes down to your, down to your skivvy shorts. And uh, barefoot, there we are, just our underpants and we're walking in line and we just handed our uniforms. Um, so they strip you of everything? Everything. Absolutely everything. Including, almost including your self-esteem in a way, do you think? I think that's to a point, um, and I think that's purposeful. I think they want to bring everybody down to the same same level, same playing field. Did you stay segregated throughout this basic training period? We were fortunate um, in, in, in two respects. Number one is we were going to be uh, the first company 
uh, that was going to move from the old World War II wooden barracks up in Great Lakes, Illinois, to the brand new uh, brick uh, buildings, the brand new barracks with new drill yards and everything. And uh, our company commander said that we were going to be one of the few companies that were going to be fully integrated. Um, so right after, I think we were there about a week and a half, and then we all mustered outside and they took the black companies and they sounded them off, one through ten, and then they took, um, you know, every tenth one they put into a white company. So we ended up uh, integrated within a matter of a couple of weeks and then we all, once we were integrated, we um, worked that day uh, cleaning the old barracks, which I always thought was kind of bizarre because they were going to tear them down anyway and the, half of the windows were broken, the beds were all rusty, and it was just nasty. Um, but we had, to, we had to field it, we had to clean those barracks. And then after we cleaned them, we marched over to the brand new uh, barracks, which we were all excited about, got new bunks, and, and then we, and then we uh, um, the company commander came in and he said, okay, now we're going to choose company officers. Um, that's going to be the uh, recruit petty officer in charge, the RPOC, assistant RPOC, and the company clerk. And first question he asked was, anybody here type? And I remember my father-in-law saying, if you can type, say yes. And so I raised my hand, and he said, you're the company clerk. And I said, okay. I wasn't sure what that meant, but uh, found out that afternoon that I had no requirement for bedtime, so I could stay up as late as I wanted. I could use the company officer's, uh, the, or the company commander's office. Uh, I'm the one that controlled all the Liberty Chits. I'm the one that, that made sure everybody was mustered in the morning and mustered at night and, and scheduled the, the whole uh, duty roster. So I had, it, I had it great in boot camp. Sure, sure. What did you like or dislike about it that you remembered? Uh, the fact that, uh, one, we got brand new barracks. Mm -hmm. um, I also like the fact that I, I didn't have to really march with everybody mm -hmm. and that I had this separate little office space. Um, I like the discipline. I really enjoyed the, uh, the regimentation and the discipline. I didn't think I would, but I, I fell right into it. I really felt comfortable there. It sounds weird, but... There was a high comfort level to that. Uh, the thing I didn't like was I, I didn't like the idea of segregation at first. Uh, so I was glad we, we became integrated. And then by, by October, it got cold. And you never, from October, November, uh, right up until Thanksgiving, you never got that cold out of you. It was just a cold damp, wet, that Chicago cold, and I, I, I never felt warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you were um, integrated, were there ever any issues, or did you all, you're all in there for the same reason? Did you get along well? Was this something new to you, for, coming from Connecticut? It was, because my, uh, um, the first black person I'd ever seen was my uh, junior year in high school. And we had one black family move in. Um, so we had, that's the first, and I thought that was just bizarre, actually. Um, my father was very racist. Um, we grew up in a neighborhood that blacks, you just didn't see blacks. And my parents were not very well educated, so we had no books in the house. Um, mm -hmm. We studied, you know, National Geographic in high school and stuff, but but uh, I'd never seen blacks before. Mm -hmm. So to be put into North Chicago, where you had a lot of blacks, and to have now blacks as part of your, as part of your company, um, that was new, and that was interesting. Um, there was some separation, natural separation, but no, I don't remember any fights, any problems, mm -hmm. nothing like that. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond basic? I did because I, because I had um, high marks in, in math and physics. I, I was uh, selected for the nuclear power program. So right after basic training, I went through machinist mate A school, which is a basic school. Um, and then right after that, 
I signed, a, I signed up for SEAL training, which is Navy Special Forces training, uh, during my A school. And at the end of A school, I was selected to go to SEALs, which I was very excited about. Uh, went through Hell Week, uh, which is, was conducted at the time, was conducted at your basic training location, which happened to be Great Lakes. Uh, made it through Hell Week. Um, and then we went through Administrative Week, where the SEAL program would check your records. And they saw a big NF stamped on my record, which meant nuclear field. And they said, sorry, we can't take you. You're already designated to go nuclear power. Uh, I was very upset about that. I wanted to be a SEAL. Um, that's probably the only thing I'm bitter about in the 22 years in the Navy is that I never went to SEAL training. And you didn't have the opportunity to go right. because someone else had, had, had chosen for you. Because the recruiter put NF on that record. Uh, and back then it was, a, it was a matter of Vice Admiral Stockdale, who was in charge of Special Forces, and Admiral Rickover. And Admiral Rickover always won. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going nuclear power. But <clears throat> I was delayed six months because of my administrative record and because I'd signed on for uh, SEALs, I'd missed the uh, first nuclear power class after A school. So I had to wait six months. So instead of going uh, immediately to nuclear power school, they put me in uh, what's called the Transient Personnel Unit, TPU. And in that TPU, I um, got a really great opportunity and that was to work on a project um, called Operation Homecoming. And what was that all about? That was bringing POWs back. Mm -hmm. This was now um, 1973, because we had Thanksgiving and Christmas off. Um, so where were, you, where were you then? Were you still? Still in Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. I had come home over Thanksgiving to yeah. Connecticut, uh, picked up my wife, and drove back out to uh, North Chicago. We got a little apartment above a bar. Uh, it was the only thing we could afford at the time. <laughs> Great entertainment during the night. Um, but then it was uh, the uh, Operation Homecoming was run out of uh, Great Lakes. It was special operations out of there. And how long were you there for? That was About six uh, months. Six months. While you were there, did your wife work? She, uh, she worked in a little vacuum cleaner repair place uh, just to make a, a few extra dollars uh, so we could make ends meet. Um, we were only making about 250 bucks a month. <laughs> you think back to that and wonder how you could do it, right? I remember, I remember uh, not having gas about the 20th of the month, not having enough money for gas, so I'd have to walk to work. Uh, and to save money, I would uh, I probably can say that now, it's a, but I would swipe fruit and, and biscuits and condiments out of the uh, galley because I was able to eat every day. And I would meet her at the gate and because uh, she'd walk in with me in the morning just so we'd have a nice walk. And uh, I'd unload my pea coat <laughs> into her bag. Of, she would have fruit and vegetables and, and yeah. condiments and little bags of little packets of honey and that kind of stuff. So we were able to save money that way. So it was Kept nice. you going, That's right? right. Um, after TPU, then where was nuclear power school? Bainbridge, Maryland. So you went from Chicago to Maryland? Straight from Chicago mm -hmm. uh, to Bainbridge, Maryland. And that was uh, six months of nuclear power school, which was very intensive. Uh, math, physics, uh, reactor theory. Um, and it was, it was like being in college again. I hated it. You uh, did? Hated it, because I, I didn't do well in college the first time. But I found that I had a much greater sense of discipline, uh, self-discipline, as a result of boot camp and A school. And uh, I ended up graduating three, third in my class, That's Nick Barr School. Um, Char Charlie Magistro and I, uh, I'm surprised that name popped into my head. Charlie Magistro and I always vied for number two and number three. Uh, I ended up number three because he did better on a final than I did. And who was number one? A uh, guy by the name of Sam Welch out of North, Winston Salem, North Carolina. He was a, a surprise. Um, he did. He just did very well. We used to poke fun at him because he was, um, you know, the old old 
the old hick, the old country boy, and there he did, Luca Parr School, he just breezed right through it. You just never know, do you? You never know. So once you finished that, were you assigned to a ship right away? Or? No, we had to go through, uh, after Nuker Power School, you had to go through Nuker Power Training uh, Program, which is a uh, land-based reactor, and you learn how to run the reactor plant. And that was another six months. And where um, was that? That also? was in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. So that was kind of convenient. It you was. almost went full circle, didn't you? It was. Um, and in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, um, it was a really weird place because it was like it was like in the middle of a tobacco field, and it was in the woods. Nobody even knew about this place, and we were on a bus. The people who were selected to go to that that NPTU Nuclear Power Training Unit. Uh, once again, we went on a bus and. We were driving through these tobacco fields, which are still there. It's by it's by the Bradley Airport, and all of a sudden you went down this dirt road into the woods, and then once you got through the woods, it just opened up, and there's a whole reactor plant right in the middle of nowhere, not powering anything. It was just used specifically for training of nuclear submariners. And how long were you there for? That was six months. Again, six months. Six months. So now you're into 1973. Right, okay. right. It was like September of 73, mm -hmm. I think it was. September, October 73. And then I got my first assignment. And where was that? And that was going to be a new one in Connecticut. And it was supposed to be a submarine tender. Um, and I reported on board the subtender. I had my sea bag and fresh kid. You know, but I was a little older than most of the other ones because I already had two years of college. Reported up there, and I met this this crusty old sailor, this master chief. Um, he was a meanest looking guy, uh, short, bald, three warts right in the middle of his forehead, and he was. I saw him. He was chewing on a cigar. And he saw my insignia, which was a machinist insignia, and he looks at me and he goes, where are you going? That's why I'm reporting on board, Master Chief. And he goes, no, you're not. And I said, okay. He took me down to the personnel office and said, this young man is coming to work for me. And nobody, nobody gave him any guff. Nobody argued with this guy. Uh, come to find out, he was the master chief in charge of the engine room on the USS Sturgeon, which was a submarine tied alongside, and he needed a couple of extra machinists. So, I re so my, my orders were changed Just that like afternoon. That. So I reported on board the, the submarine tender and then the USS Fulton and then immediately uh, to the USS Sturgeon on board the submarine. So you're doing all this on your own. You're not with a, an actual unit at right. going forward. Right. No, okay. by the time you got out of nuclear power school and nuclear power training, uh, you didn't go as a unit. Uh, all the submarines went independently. So where did you and the USS Sturgeon go? Well, I, I uh, thought I was going to be on a tender and have a three-year tour on a tender, so my wife was all excited. We got a nice little apartment in, in Connecticut, and um, she thought this was going to be great because uh, we had just had our first child in 73, and uh, she said, oh, this is going to be great. You're going to be home for three years. This is nice, like a regular job. Um, I was supposed to come home that night for dinner. Uh, didn't, didn't get home until two days later. Uh, wasn't able to call her. Um, she was worried. She tried to call the submarine uh, tender. Nobody knew of me because I never checked in. Um, so she had no idea where I was until three days later I managed to call her and say, I'm on a submarine and, and uh, we're going to sea in, in a week. <laughs> and did you so, know where you were going to be going? No, we had no idea. And we had no idea what's Where did you end up going? Um, we ended up going to the Mediterranean for six and a half months, um, which was great because I was able to travel. So I was able to see the Mediterranean, um, but I, was, um, I ended up going to the Med, and when we pulled into uh, Naples, I had a chance to call her and say, you know, I'm in the Mediterranean, and uh, I'll see you in uh, six months. How did she take that? 
She was a little upset about that at first, mm -hmm. um, but then, uh, you know, that's part of Navy life. Right. And she had to have been used to it a bit, having grown up that she way. Was. Mm -hmm. She was. She mm was. -hmm. So she was, uh, I think she was less upset about it than I was initially, mm -hmm. because she had been used to it. Had you ever, prior to joining the Navy, had you ever traveled to Europe before, or was this something new to this you too? This was brand new. And were you able to utilize time off to see the sights, or? I was one of those weird sailors. Um, I, uh, most, of, most of my colleagues, my shipmates, would, uh, as soon as we pulled into port, they would go to the nearest bar, uh, get drunk, and then have to be dragged home, but dragged to the boat that night. Um, I, I was always one who wanted to just see the sights. And uh, my first trip to Italy, I uh, got on a bus, uh, made friends with the bus driver, and we, uh, I, I stayed on the bus that whole day uh, with the bus driver. And I ended up buying him lunch, I ended up buying him dinner, so I had my own tour guide that whole day. Uh, thought it was fantastic. And then uh, every time we pulled into port after that, I just made friends with a bus driver. And mm -hmm. I got to see some incredible sights, um, all the art, all the architecture, um, even went on a couple of archaeological digs uh, while I was out in the Mediterranean. Um, my second trip to the Med, um, I actually packed a uh, tuxedo uh, on board the submarine so that I could go to operas. Um, I developed a, a love for the opera, which I still have today. Now when you weren't sightseeing and you're on the sub, what were you doing? What was the day like for you? It was a pretty busy day. Um, you'd get up early in the morning. Um, if you were in port, you, uh, you get up early. Uh, the chief or the mass chief would wake you up early and then you went back and worked in the engine room. Uh, since I was a machinist, it was always uh, oiling to do, clean up to do, um, always machinery to repair. Back then, the machinists on board, or the sailors on board, did all the repairs. Nowadays, it's called plug and play, and um, you bring extra spare parts, or, and now it's just a matter of, um, there's very little maintenance that's done by the sailors anymore. It's all you unplug the piece of equipment, plug put a, in a new, new one piece. in. Whereas before, you had to really fix it. You had to fix everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I really learned a lot about machinery, and gained an incredible amount of self confidence uh, to the point where I believe I can fix just about anything. Now, was the master, the master chief, chief was he the one that was teaching you, or other sailors? The um, if you weren't actually engaged in maintenance, um, you had to go to class. Mm -hmm. And it was self-taught classes. So the first class or the chiefs would hold a class uh, on a particular pump or a valve or a turbine or something in the engine room. Mm -hmm. We would literally, you'd get, the, you'd get the engine room department together, like, like all the machinist mates together. You'd get all the machinist mates together and you'd say, okay, we're going to tear apart this pump today and you'd take it offline, um, use, the other, use the, the other pump, um, and then we would tear it apart. And he'd say, okay, uh, you, I want you, to, I want you to put the impeller together. You, I want you to repack the valve. You, I want you to repack the stem. You, I want you to rewind the motor. So it was always on the job training, and we would have the manual right there, and he'd teach us how to use the manual and be very, very detail-oriented. Um, and it was, and all of that, and it was like that every day, whether you were out at sea or in port, uh, you had maintenance, you had training, uh, you had some recreation, and then the Master Chief always made sure that you spent uh, an hour a day um, reading or letter writing. This particular Master Chief, as, as crusty as he was, and as mean as he was, uh, he made sure that every day we set aside an hour uh, to write letters or read something. He didn't care what we read. We had to read something. Not having been on a submarine before, what was it like for you? And being out at sea, 
was there seasickness? Was there any kind of feelings of claustrophobia or anything? Some like of that? my friends did. This is the other strange thing: is that is that I felt comfortable on board the submarine. Mm -hmm. It felt natural for me. Mm -hmm. um, some guys would sit there and watch as the hatches would close and they would freak out a little bit or they'd get nervous. Um, they'd go, they'd become melancholy for a few days uh, because, you know, once the hatch is shut and you start diving, submerging, um, you were going to be down there for two months, three months, a week, two weeks. You had no idea. Were there ever any close calls or issues while you were down there? A uh, few. We had a few close calls. You want to talk about those? Um, we had um, we had one guy, um, and there were a couple of deaths on board um, that I experienced in my 22 years. Um, 22 years you were in the service. In the service, so, 16 years on submarines, wow. uh, and my ex-wife. Uh, Calculated, and I had always kept a calendar uh, while I was out at sea, uh, days submerged, and she'd calculated that I had been submerged almost 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> out of that 16 years, it was almost 12 years underwater. Oh, my so, word. So I, yeah. um, I, I thought that was kind of funny at my retirement ceremony. She said, you know. Some statistics that yeah, were Here's some interest. interesting notes. Uh, but we had a couple, a couple of close calls. This was during the height of the Cold War. Um, so the submarines we were on, I was on, were mostly in the Atlantic, and it was mostly up in the uh, GIUK Gap, which is Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom, that corridor right there, where the Soviets would always come down. Um, and then we were, we were on fast attacks. I was on fast attacks at the time. And what does that mean? Um, these were the hunter-killers of the submarines, as opposed to the boomers, uh, which were the fleet ballistic missile, those were the missile submarines. And I, I was on both, but my first couple of tours were on fast attacks. And um, we had um, one run where, um, now we, it's declassified now, but the Soviets were shooting torpedoes at us. Uh, they were unarmed torpedoes. It was just to let us know. These were little cat and mouse games. Um, and one of the torpedoes, we'd heard it in the water. I was in the engine room where I could hear it, because you could hear things through the hull. It's kind of interesting. And you know what a torpedo sounds like. It's got a high-pitched whine. And, and all of a sudden, we heard this high-pitched whine getting closer and closer and closer. And we did a maneuver. We went down to uh, test depth, uh, which scared the daylights out of us. Uh, some of the bolts from the from the piping popped off and there was some leaks in the engine room and so just like in of, the movies just exactly <laughs> like in the movies it was really weird um, and then and then the captain came on and he said uh, brace for impact uh, we didn't know we were going to hit the bottom or hit a, hit another sub or something but but uh, this torpedo just boom just hit us and it was uh, it was a dud it was just a game it was just a game, and it was really bizarre. Um, Almost like Russian roulette. It was. It was. It was the weirdest thing, and it was at that point that I realized that um, I was going to become a little bit more interested in history and politics, and I started reading everything I could about the Soviets, and realized that the Cold War was a. It was a game. It was all a game. Now, how, how many different subs were you on throughout your career, and why did you decide to make it a career? Um, I knew after my first submarine, when I was on my first sub, the Sturgeon. And how long were you on the Sturgeon for? I was on there um, 18 months. And then um, <laughs> the Master Chief from the Pargo, who was in the shipyard, uh, came over to our submarine and said, we need a few uh, machinists on board because we lost some of our guys due to drug busts in the 70s and uh, sailors engaging in drugs. And so my master chief said, uh, this guy's good, take him. And I advanced fairly quickly. And uh, when you advanced, did you also advance as far as 
did you go in as an ensign or? No, I went in as an oiler. An oiler. A uh, fireman. Fireman, I was, uh, okay. MMFN, machinist mate fireman, uh, which at the time was an E3. Uh, and the only reason I was an E3 was because I had two years of college. So Otherwise they, you would have been an E1. E1. Okay. Uh, so they put me in as an E3. And then right after nuclear power school, I was advanced to E4, which is petty officer, which is what I was when I reported aboard the Sturgeon. And then the master chief, back then, it was up to the master chief. If he felt you were good, he'd tell you to go take the exams. And I was always studying, and I was always trying to learn equipment. Um, so I, was, uh, I took the exams early, uh, and I was advanced to... Uh, Petty officer second class very quickly, and then uh, petty officer first class within four and a half years. Uh, normally, it takes six to seven years to make first class. So that was quite an accomplishment. It was very, very quick, and it was all attributed to the fact that I was hungry for learning the machinery, and I had a master chief who was just a mean old codger that would just, but he was mean in the sense that he would drive you hard. And, and wanted responded. you to learn yeah. and get ahead. I never realized it at the time. But looking back, but do looking you see back, that? Yeah. there is no doubt in my mind that he really wanted all of us to do as well as we possibly could and advance very quickly. So from the Sturgeon, what was the name of the ship? I went to Pargo. P-A-R-G-O. Mm -hmm. um, and then I made first class on the Pargo. Uh, and then... Um, I was on air for the shipyard. We went out for the sea trials. Now the shipyard meaning? Where the submarines repaired. In Connecticut? In Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, got a, a, I was only on there for four months. Uh, and then I got called uh, to go on board uh, the Rayburn, Sam Rayburn, which was a, a boomer. Uh, and a boomer is, F has the? Ballistic missiles. OK. Still a machinist. Uh, but now I was going to be the leading petty officer. Um, and this is all, you know, these, these uh, duty stations just happen very quickly. Um, normally you're on board a year and a half, two years, sometimes three years. Um, but for some reason, my, my tour was uh, abnormal. I'd be on for four months, five months, six months. Um, Sam Rayburn, I was on for about 18 months and then uh, got pulled off the Rayburn um, to go on the Russell. Do you think it was because you're, of your reputation as being a really good, in this case, petty officer, but good machinist that... Looking back on it... Probably. Um, probably. So, um, I'm sorry, from the Rayburn, Rayburn where? Went to the Russell, which was a special operations boat. And what a is fast that? attack, still a hunter-killer. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was outfitted for under ice, outfitted for um, ultra quiet capabilities, high tech stuff. Um, the captain who was on there, uh, never forget the guy, he was a phenomenal captain, Arlington Fitchner Campbell III. And I said, this guy's going to make Admiral. He just sounds like an Admiral. Uh, great guy, absolutely great guy. Um, he kept us informed of everything, um, said we're going to be doing some great stuff, some interesting stuff, and um, always kept us informed, even, though, even us in the engine room. And where did you go on the Russell? Um, some places are still classified, mm -hmm. um, but we went... Um, and when was this? This was 77, okay. 78, 78. 1978, by now. Um, and we ended up going north of uh, North Cape, um, up into Murmansk, um, under the ice, uh, Arctic Circle. What was that like? Could you hear? You could hear. Was it different? It was scary. Um, crackling ice? You could hear the crackling ice. Uh, we were outfitted to be able to break through the ice. Um, and we did a couple of times, went up uh, past the Arctic Circle and uh, broke through the ice, about 10 feet of ice broke through. And you ever see those pictures of the submarine rising up, 
rising up through the ice, and then the big ice pack just comes down the side of the sail. And uh, we thought that was the coolest thing because we went up there and we all put on goggles so they wouldn't get snow blind. And we had shorts, boots, uh, heavy jackets, and we went out and played baseball on the, uh, on the ice floor. <laughs> I had to paint the ball black so we could see it, but we, we played baseball on the ice. Uh, now, the Arctic when you were on the sub, what was your attire? What did you normally wear while you were working? Back in the 70s and early 80s, up until Jimmy Carter became president in 76, um, it was very lax. Um, we had there were no grooming standards. You could grow your hair as long as you wanted. You could grow your beard as long as you wanted. Um, Generally speaking, you didn't take showers for the first uh, few weeks on, on board because uh, they always put food in the showers so you'd have enough food. Um, so, you, so they used them as storage They used areas. storage. Everything, every square inch of that submarine was used for storage. Um, so you had fresh fruits and vegetables hanging in the showers because they were all stainless steel. So when, uh, when you're done, you ate your way into the showers basically and then they would hose them down. Mm -hmm. Um, so generally you didn't take showers uh, for the first few weeks out at sea. And um, the order of water went reactor plant first, uh, cooking second, the officers third, and enlisted last. So that was always, um, sometimes we wouldn't take showers for five, six, seven weeks. Um, so it was interesting. Now back then, it was male only? Ma it still is. It still is male it only? It still is. Okay. Submarine Force is, uh, there's only two areas in the military right now, um, actually three. Frontline combat, which is still male only, although you're now, now starting to see with Iraq, you're now starting to see women uh, in the front line, especially helicopter pilots and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, special Forces like Navy SEALs, Delta Force, uh, Rangers, all male, I mean, all, all male, and then submarines, all male, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. There's no reason for it. So you made this a career. Did your wife make it a career also at that time as a, as a Navy wife? She did. And yeah, we talked about it. Yeah. And we had decided that we were going to, you know, once we, once we made the first, uh, because you were able to re-enlist, right. and at the four-year point, uh, I had signed on for an initial six years, and at the four-year point, I was given the opportunity to re-enlist and get a re-enlistment bonus of $12,000 uh, because I was in a special rating uh, in nuclear power. So I was able to get uh, a nice $12,000 check, which was, which was nice, but I had to sign on for six years. And at that point, at the four-year point, my wife and I talked, and I said, and we both agreed, actually, that if I was going to re-enlist, this was going to put us out to the 10-year point. And if I was going to re-enlist now, then we're staying in for 20. If I'm not going to stay in for 20, I might as well just get out at the six-year point. And she said, no, you love it too much. I enjoy it. We're traveling a little bit. Um, so we're staying in. And was she based in Connecticut? Most she was, of the time? most of the time. I was very fortunate um, in that most of my duty stations were in Connecticut, uh, although we did travel a little bit. Uh, I got to travel quite a bit. And then once we started saving up a little bit more money, um, I actually flew her to Italy one time. When you were going to be over there. I was going to be over there, mm -hmm. and uh, the officers' wives generally came overseas because they could afford it. Uh, but we had saved up enough money, and a good friend of mine, uh, his wife, came over at the same time. So she was able to spend a week in Italy with me. So that had to be fun. That was great fun. Yeah. That was great yeah. fun. Um, 20 years. So any, uh, when you mentioned earlier about some deaths, was it usually drug-related or accident or intentional? Uh, one was an intentional. Um, I experienced three deaths on board submarines. Um, the first one was an accident. Um, we were working in the engine room, and um, we were in the North Atlantic, and this guy, um, we, had to, we had to pull out a pump, um, and it was rough seas, and we had to be on the surface because the reactor had a problem. 
Uh, so we had to go up on the surface. So you're on the surface, you're taking 20 degree rolls, and we had to take out this pump and re replace it, repair it and replace it. And there were three of us who were trained on this particular pump. Uh, myself, one other guy, and these two other guys. And I said, we gotta be really careful because the submarine's taking some heavy rolls and we gotta watch, watch out. And uh, we moved the pump out, we unrigged it, we moved it out, so it was hanging and it was swinging. So the three of us were trying to maneuver this pump so we could set it on a frame and bolt it down. And before we could bolt it down, uh, the submarine took a heavy roll and this pump just for some, it went away from me and it slammed into these two guys. I managed to grab one guy and pull him away. Uh, he had a, a right arm crushed, uh, but the other guy took the, the pump full in the chest, uh, just crushed him. Uh, that had to be very difficult for you. It, it was. Um, and what about the second? The second one was after uh, I had become an officer. Um, this was in 83, and he was a young kid. Um, we were in port, and even to this day, I, I think I, sh I sh should have probably noticed something about this kid. Um, he was melancholy all the time, uh, didn't f fit right onto submarines for some reason, um, and he was a topside watch, and I was a duty officer. Uh, we were in port, topside watches had sidearms, so we always carried a 45. And there were two topside watches at all times. And I was making my rounds as a duty officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just crossed underneath the hatch, and I hear this bang. And I wasn't quite sure what it was, because um, it didn't sound like a gun, but you know how it sounds like a gun, but not. Um, and I called around, I'm, I called around below decks and I said, did you guys hear any of this? Did you guys hear this pop sound? I said, no, 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 everything's fine. Um, and I go topside to finish my rounds and there's one of the topside watches, he's just sitting there uh, crying. I said, well, what's the problem? And he, all he did was just point. And I went around to the other side of the sail and there's this kid who is just slumped against the side of the sail. He had shot himself. Shot himself. How old was he? 17 and a half. Mm. So what happens then? You have to report that. We're lucky we were in port for that one. Mm -hmm. um, so I called the uh, squadron duty officer and we get the uh, corpsman down, we get the doctors down, base hospital comes down with a, with a uh, vehicle and um, take pictures and everything. And then we have to call divers because the gun fell out of his hand, went over the side. So we had to get the divers down and uh, do a search at the bottom to get the gun. They found it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, then what ha who has to tell the family? Well, normally there's a uh, uh, grief officer assigned to the squadron. Uh, but I asked the grief officer if I could actually I actually make the report. And was that difficult for you too? It was very tough. Um, so I went with the grief officer um, and we uh, flew out to the family and uh, reported to the family. Had they known that there were some issues, do you think? No, they never suspected. Mm -hmm. um, the letters that they got were seemed fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was sad, homesick, mm -hmm. like, like we all are. but. Um, Nothing out of the ordinary. His, his uh, division officer, his leading petty officer, didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. Um, but, you know, he was one of those kids who was just melancholy and would always sit by himself in the mess decks or watch movies and sit in the back instead of joking around with everybody. And so sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on with someone just, who's a little inward. Yeah. What about the third case? Um, Third case was, uh, once again, North Atlantic. Um, and we were, once again, rough seas. Uh, we were taking green water over the sail. We we're up on a surface again. Um, and explain to those non-sailors what green uh, water over the sail means. Well, green water, normally the sail is, um, when you're on the surface, the submarine has 
one third of the submarine hull is visible and then two thirds is below the water. But then you have this sail part where all the periscopes come up out of. And uh, I was duty, uh, I was an officer of deck at the time and I was on the sail. And uh, you're up there, because whenever the submarine's on the surface, there has to be an officer and enlisted up on a sail. Uh, lookout, uh, and the officer is the one who steers the ship and gives orders from, from the bridge. Um, so you're about 35 feet over the top of the water. Uh, so it's pretty good size. And green water is, uh, you have uh, white water, which is the caps, and then green water is the water that's fairly deep. <laughs> it's dark water. Um, and we were taking uh, 30, 35 foot waves. And my lookout, uh, there's nobody in the North Atlantic. Uh, you're in the middle of winter, it's freezing. Uh, we're all in exposure suits, we're tied in. Um, and my lookout, I told him, I said, the only thing I want you to watch for is the waves. Just watch for the waves. Let me know which way the waves are coming so we know when to duck, get down, hang on, let the wave break over the top of us. And then we can maneuver the ship to get around. Um, and then we had uh, two guys had to come up through the hull, open the hatch, come up through the hull because we had a problem back aft. And uh, I told those guys, I said, watch it, it's very slippery, there's ice forming already. And uh, one guy comes up and he was immediately washed over the side, just gone, gone. It happened, I was watching back there, um, my lookout was watching forward to watch for the waves. I was looking back to watch for these two guys. I was on communications with the captain below decks, and we had a safety officer back. We'd done everything right, everything right. And this kid came up. He was 19, um, a diver, trained diver. Um, you're supposed to come up. Instead of coming up, you're supposed to just reach up and latch your hook into the top of the sail, on top of the submarine, which is just a, a crawlway. Uh, and your lanyard holds you up, holds you in place. So in case you're washed over the side, you can only go eight feet, uh, which is the length of the lanyard. And he didn't do that? And uh, he put his head too far up, and he came up, came up to about this far. A wave broke, sucked him right out of the, right out of the hatch, and over the side, gone. And in seas like that, you can't really do a search, no. can you? No. So he died at sea? And what happened there? Did you also feel the need to tell that family, or? Um, no, the captain, uh, the captain took on that responsibility. We sent the message out, and you, you can't break uh, your op your operations. Um, so the captain just sent the message out uh, to the squadron, and uh, we we're going to be about another month and a half before we we're going to be home, and so we all had to deal with uh, this guy being gone, washed over the side. So then. Who tells the rest of the crew that something like that has happened? Captain does. Mm -hmm. the captain calls a, uh, a crew gathering in the, in the crew's mess mm -hmm. in the, where we eat mm -hmm. and uh, says, uh, you know, we lost one of our shipmates over the side. Um, we're taking 30 foot waves. Um, the water is uh, 35 degrees. Right. Um, so chances are he probably had maybe a few minutes in the water and that was it. Quick. Quick. You mentioned initially um, that you were up to a chief petty officer and now you're a duty officer. When did that all happen? I made, uh, I was the youngest chief in the Navy uh, because of this master chief, uh, very quick, rapid advancement. And um, I made chief petty officer in seven years, uh, nine months, and that was uh, unheard of at the time. Um, and um, I, I wanted to make chief. I wanted to be called chief. Uh, you wear different uniforms. Instead of wearing blue uniforms, you wear khaki uniforms, and it was just a status. It was just, when you made chief from the enlisted ranks, you were the senior enlisted guy, that meant that you made it. Uh, that was the, as high as you were gonna go. Mm -hmm. And I'd made chief, um, and I'd made it very quickly. Um, and part of the reason I made it very quickly was because of this master chief, and I'd always kept that sense about me. Um, taking exams early, 
uh, getting him to order the exams early, get me ready for the exams. And it wasn't just me. We had a few guys that mm -hmm. he, he took under his wing like that. Um, and even when we weren't serving with him, he would always connect with the other Master Chiefs because uh, it's a small community. Submarine Force is a small community. And he would tell the other Master Chiefs, I want this guy to advance. I want him up there. I want him doing this. I want him doing that. So he saw potential even though you didn't realize he was watching. Right. Right. And Were you a similar chief, or did you have a different rapport with your, well, I call underlings, what would you call them? Well, your, subordinates. Subordinates. Yeah, I wasn't the best. <laughs> you were. <laughs> I was, I ended up being just like him. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I was as mean as he was, and I didn't chew on a cigar like he did. Uh, but I was, uh, I pushed. I pushed my crew very hard. I pushed my division very hard. Um, I, I was uh, not only the division chief, I was the educational officer on board. I placed a high emphasis on education. Um, I, had, uh, I had earned a bachelor's degree while I was out at sea. You did? Taking correspondence courses. In? Um, in mechanical engineering. Um, and then uh, I was uh, recruited um, in 1980, 1980 um, to be an instructor at Nuker Power School. Um, and I didn't want to go. And my captain said, you, you've got to go. Uh, you're going to be an instructor there. So I went down to Nuker Power School, Orlando, Florida. We thought it was great because the kids were young, being a Disney World area. Uh, so I took the duty station and I taught uh, Reactor theory, mechanical theory, and uh, thermodynamics uh, while I was down there. And how long were you there for? Year and a half. Um, because I applied for, while I was down there, um, the captain of Nuker Power School uh, ordered me to uh, apply for officer program. And I said, no, I'm going to be an officer. I'm happy being a chief. He said, no, 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 you're going to be an officer. I want you to apply for the officer program, which I did. And I was accepted on the first round uh, for officer program. And uh, while I was at Nuker Power School, I had earned uh, my second bachelor's, uh, except this time it was in history and politics. That's uh, terrific. And then I uh, got selected for officer program, went to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, officer candidate school. This was in November of 82. And then right after that, um, I was asked whether I wanted to be a nuclear officer by um, the new admiral, because Admiral Rickover had died by then. And admiral McKee said, uh, you're going to be a nuclear officer, aren't you? And I said, no, sir. I want to be a weapons officer. I want to be a, I want to be the guy who launches the torpedoes or launches the missiles. I want to be that guy. And uh, he had me in his office for 45 minutes. Um, trying to convince, trying to convince you convince otherwise? Me. He said, you've already got two degrees. Uh, you've taken all the courses at Nuker Power School as officer courses at Nuker Power School. You were staff. He said, I can give you $18,000 today. I can give you the final exam for Nuker Power School as an officer which I know you'll pass. You'll go three months at Nuker Power Training Unit, and then you'll go right back to sea as an officer, one of my Nuker officers. Do you want to do that? I said, no, sir. So I turned him down, um, became a weapons officer instead, and uh, loved it. It was one of my best decisions I ever made. And how long was that training for? That was six months. And was that in Rhode Island? No, that was in uh, my uh, officer candidate school was um, 14, 15 weeks in Newport, Rhode Island. And then I went to Damneck, Virginia for uh, six months of weapons training. And then uh, right on board a uh, new submarine, Kamehameha, uh, USS Kamehameha, uh, as a torpedo officer. And... Uh, had my, had my own division as an officer. Got to eat in the wardroom. Got to be a duty officer. 
What was the uh, difference being a duty officer, and um, what was your rank at that point? I was an 01 ensign. An ensign? I was an ensign. What was the difference in the way you felt, but also the way you were treated versus um, when you were um, a chief? A chief. Uh, felt very different. Um, in what way? You were not supposed to get your hands dirty as an officer. You weren't supposed to touch the equipment. Was that hard for you? Very hard. Mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, whenever anybody wasn't looking, I was always cleaning something or I would be with my division and we were painting together. So I was always working on the equipment with them. Do you think the men appreciated that? I do. Mm -hmm. I really do. Uh, as long as you're able to maintain the boundaries between officer and enlisted, mm -hmm. you know, senior and subordinate. Um, and, and I was able to do that. Um, but they really respected the fact that I knew as much about the equipment and how to maintain the equipment as they did. And then how long did you stay as a um, weapons officer? I stayed, um, I was on the command mayor for about a year and a half, um, almost, almost two years. I was supposed to be a three-year weapons tour. And then my captain called me into the stateroom one day and he said, uh, you're being transferred. And I went, excuse me? He said, yeah, you're being transferred. I said, why? I said, I've still got a year tour yet. And he said, I don't know, you're being transferred. And where did they transfer you? They Who transferred, transferred me you? to the USS Nevada uh, which was a um, brand new Trident submarine, uh, Cadillacs of submarines, um, brand new in the shipyard, new construction. I was one of the first group of officers to report aboard. And um, I reported to a guy by the name of Captain Rome. And I went into his stateroom and I asked him, I said, Captain, why, why am I here? He said, uh, I handpicked my officers. And he said, uh, I wanted you. Is your record is exemplary? And he says, uh, you're a great machinist and you're a good division officer. And he said, I want you to be my uh, tactical systems officer, uh, which is the assistant weapons officer for the nuclear missiles, uh, as well as the torpedo officer. So did you have mixed emotions about that? You hear you're getting quite a recommendation from this new um, commander, and yet you weren't expecting it. You weren't expecting to, to be taken off the Kamehameha so quickly. I, I did, because I, I had a really good rapport with the people on board the Kamehameha, with the captain, mm -hmm. um, a guy by the name of Captain Jacoby, great guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I had some great captains, really good commanding officers. Um, who really pushed education, pushed training, pushed all these things. Um, and I was very fortunate there. Um, but this captain, Captain Rome, uh, phenomenal, once again, a phenomenal guy. Um, and, uh, you know, I initially had really mixed emotions because I wanted to stay at sea. I didn't want to go into the shipyard again. But this guy said he really wanted me on the shipyard. Uh, and so I developed a really good relationship with uh, the other weapons officers. Uh, with the executive officer and a captain. Uh, we had a phenomenal wardroom, uh, officers group. Um, so it really worked out fantastically. Uh, it was a great, great duty station. And we were able to build the submarine um, from scratch. And I was able to see a submarine built from scratch and put a crew together. I was able, the captain gave me the ability to handpick my enlisted, handpick my chiefs handpicked my enlisted, so I was able to look at all the records and realize that, you know, sometimes your jobs in the Navy uh, or in the military are picked for you. Um, there are people up there just handpicking <laughs> whoever they want, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, and I, I got to see that firsthand. Uh, so I put together a pretty good division. So did it go out to sea with you on it? 
It did. We went out, uh, we did the sea trials, and I was the uh, officer of deck for the sea trials. First time out at sea. Uh, the captain picked me to be the officer of deck for the sea trials. And uh, the admiral who I had turned down, Admiral McKee, uh, for nuclear power program, uh, that admiral is on board for every submarine's uh, first dive. He makes it a point. That was his, what he wanted to do. And uh, he was standing right next to me when I ordered the submarine to take its first dive. And I just looked over at him and I said, you don't remember me, do you? And he said, oh, yes, I do. He's the other one who turned me down. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. He says, I bet you're not happy about it now. And I said, oh, yes, I am. Look where I am. I'm taking a brand new Trident submarine on its first dive, and you're standing right next to me. I said, if I went in with your program, I'd be back in the engine room. I wouldn't be experiencing this. And he said, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> so I ended up staying on there um, and developed a great relationship with uh, another guy, um, uh, Tom Sousa, and he and I are like brothers, and we still are to this day. Um, we keep in touch. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be seeing him in a few weeks, going down to Florida, and we, we just, we're, we're literally like brothers. And so that's a relationship I developed on board in Nevada. Um, took that out to sea, um, took it through the Panama Canal, um, out to Bremerton, Washington. And while I was heading on, out to sea, uh, he managed to get uh, my wife and three kids and the household all packed up, his wife and three kids and the household all packed up, and moved out to Bremerton, Washington, out, out by Bangor. Um, and we were there for uh, nine months. So I, was, I took the submarine out uh, through the Panama Canal, up the Pacific coast, uh, did all the trials on it, did a couple of runs on it. And then uh, I got called once again. <laughs> to, to go, go elsewhere. To go to Submarine Forces Pacific Fleet, uh, go out subpac, Submarine Forces Pacific Fleet, uh, Pearl Harbor as the uh, force uh, navigator and weapons officer. So I got a chance to uh, go out there and actually um, determine where submarines go. And I spent uh, two years in Hawaii, which my wife and kids loved because that was shore duty. It was my really first true shore duty. How did you feel being on shore after all those years? Didn't like it. You wanted to be out I loved the job. Yeah. Great job. But missed the sea. I missed the sea. I still miss the sea. Mm -hmm. I really missed going out to sea. And uh, because I was a force navigator and force weapons officer, submarine force, uh, Pacific weapons officer, I assigned myself to inspection teams out at sea. So I'd be the officer in charge to go out to sea for three weeks and just do inspections on board of something, so just so I could get got back your on fill. submarines. That's right. Got, your got my fix. <laughs> and how long were you in Hawaii? You said two years? Two years. And then what? Uh, by then it was uh, 19... Mm -hmm. What the heck was that? It was 1990. Um, yeah, it was 1990. Bush was president. Uh, Bush Sr. was president. And uh, I was supposed to go back to sea again. Um, and we had just started having, the Cold War was over, Bush administration. So my whole career now, uh, fighting the Soviets, and something that I had looked back years before and said, why are we doing this, uh, came full circle. And I realized that Cold War was over and we had basically put ourselves out of a job. Um, and so we didn't, we downsized the number of submarines by almost two thirds. Uh, so my availability of going back out to sea was limited. Um, so they sent me after my tour in London, um, after my tour in Hawaii, um, I wouldn't go back to sea again, which made me kind of sad. Uh, they said, you're going to go and you're going to train brand new officers. So they sent me out to officer, um, uh, submarine officer school in New London, back in New London, Connecticut. So we come full circle again. And uh, I trained uh, new officers who were getting ready to go to sea. 
um, trained them on being uh, weapons officers, tactical systems officers, sonar officers, torpedo officers. Because um, you had done it all. I did. And I was jealous. That they were getting to do it. They were getting to do it. Yeah. And then in 92, Clinton comes in. And uh, by then I had 20 years in, 92. And uh, Clinton gave the order that he was going to downsize the military by 40%. Cut the number of military. And the captain calls me in, captain in a submarine school, calls me in and he said, Gary, you've got 20 years in. You've done all the jobs you can. You can't be a captain on a submarine because you're not a nuclear trained officer. Um, so it's time to retire. And I went, I'm not going. He said, you're not going to make. You're not staying in. So 91 uh, or 93 calls me in his office again. And he said, because this is the first time in my life that I didn't advance. Mm -hmm. I was now a lieutenant. I was going to be a lieutenant commander. You were a lieutenant at that point. I was a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was up for early promotion for lieutenant commander. And uh, I didn't select. Didn't make it. And when I, he called me into his office and he said, you didn't make it, not because you're not good enough or not because you haven't got the skills or not because you're not a good officer. You didn't make it because we don't need you. And I said, well, I'm not going. <laughs> and in 94, um, this was in uh, late 93, it was December of 93, right before Christmas, he calls me into his office and he said, you're not going to make it. And he says, so I'm going to give you two choices, Gary. He says, February 1st, 94, um, you're going to have two choices. You can either draw a $20,000 severance check and you're going home after 22 years. Or when you come back from Christmas, you can have your retirement papers and put them on my desk and you'll retire with a full pension for the rest of your life. <laughs> so it was, it was an easy decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, so I took the pension. Mm -hmm. um, what were you feeling like about coming home? I mean, home meaning wherever that place might be, but coming away from what was your life for 22 years? Scared. Mm -hmm. Scared to death um, because I didn't think that anything that I had done in the service uh, because by then I had earned two bachelors, a master's. I had a box full of certificates of training from the military. So you earned your master's while you were in there too. Okay. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, master's in social science specializing in international politics. Um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> so you really wanted to learn I did. what was ex you were experiencing throughout the Cold War. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I didn't, I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't think I was trained to do anything, qualified to do anything, um, civilian life. Um, and then when I retired February, I was pretty depressed, uh, for a couple of months. Um, didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, didn't know, uh, what, you know, I felt I wasn't qualified to do anything other than submarines. Um, and then uh, my wife at the time said, well, you need to go to a training seminar, a transition seminar. Um, so I did, went to a transition seminar, and there was a great guy there from the VA uh, who sat down with me, because we each had a private counselor, uh, mm -hmm. sat down and translated everything I'd done in the military into civilian language. And then we built a resume. And he said, we're going to send this resume out today. Uh, two days later, I had a job with the state of Connecticut <laughs> managing a landfill and hazardous materials retraining program. And I said, I would never done anything like that before. And they said, we don't care. You know how to manage. Um, two weeks after that, friend, I got a phone call from a guy uh, who was an old master chief of mine. And he was now the Dean of Academics at Mitchell College in New London, Connecticut, because we were living in Connecticut then. 
and uh, he calls me up and he said, Gary, he says, I need you to teach a history class. This was a Thursday afternoon, and I said, you're crazy, I'm not teaching a history class. He says, you've got two bachelors and a master's. He says, you've studied your whole life, you're ready. And I said, I'm not teaching. Uh, calls me up again Friday morning, wakes me up, and said, I need to talk to you, I'll buy you lunch. I said, well, if you're buying lunch, I'll, <laughs> I'll go. So I went, had lunch with him on Friday afternoon, and he said, uh, I need you to teach this history class. My instructor broke his leg, skiing, can't teach. Um, all the adjuncts are already hired. He said, the class starts Monday. I need somebody to fill the, I just need a warm body in the class, that's all I want. And uh, it took him all afternoon to convince me. Uh, and I finally did. He gave me the book, the syllabus, everything. He said, just show up on Monday morning. Um, showed up Monday morning, I was scared to death. I went up, I threw up twice before I went to the classroom. I said, I can't do this. I don't Got into the classroom, nervous, didn't think I knew anything. Uh, I had 20 students in the class, Mitchell College. Um, but then about halfway through the class, I developed a comfort level. Mm -hmm. It's the same comfort level I had when I was on the submarine. And you were always not only learning, but you were teaching. So you had the natural it knack. Took, yeah. Hmm. And I, I quit my job with hazardous materials retraining hmm. uh, and hazmat coordination, state of Connecticut. And um, I've been an adjunct professor of history and politics ever since. And where? At Mitchell? I was at Mitchell, um, UConn, Eastern, community colleges all through Connecticut uh, from 95 uh, up until 07 when I moved to Massachusetts. Um, I got a letter from the VA in 02, 01, 2001. I got a letter from the VA, 2000. I got a letter from the VA saying that Vietnam era veterans are not using their VA educational benefits fast enough and they're dying at a faster rate than other veterans. Um, so if you want, you got three more years of education. And I went, okay. Uh, so the VA paid for three more years. I was gonna go for a second master's. Um, in my first class as a second master's degree, uh, the VA calls me in, the VA rep at UConn calls me in and said, uh, you can't take a master's. You have to go for one degree higher than the one you got. And I said, well, I'm not writing a book. I'm not doing a PhD. And so I just took the coursework. I signed up for the PhD, never intending to finish it. Um, but my advisor, Gary Clifford, um, cajoled, uh, bribed, did everything he possibly could to get me to finish. So I ended up finishing a PhD in 2005 in political science. So I started out as a mechanical engineer and end up as a political scientist, <laughs> historian. Um, it's been a great ride. Now you said earlier you weren't gonna write a book, but has that changed at all? I ended up doing my dissertation um, on Nixon's foreign policy. Uh, ended up being 250 pages, and I'm now, after, because it's now been three years since I've gotten my PhD, I've gone back and I've reread it this past year, and uh, I'm editing it now to get it published. And uh, a Coast Guard friend of mine uh, calls me up, and because uh, he was teaching intelligence at the Coast Guard Academy, I was teaching political science as an adjunct at the Coast Guard Academy. We developed a friendship, and uh, we're working on another book uh, called Guardian Spies about uh, Coast Guard and the. OSS, uh, which is the Office of Secret Service, precursor to the CIA, uh, during 1943 and 1944 uh, in the Burma Theater in India. So he and I are working on that project right now, and we should, we should be done probably in about a year and a half, maybe two years. That's exciting. It's, it's great fun. And You've always been a study in history, so you're continuing to do that. So not only are you teaching, but you're continuing to learn. I am. I am. Teaching is like stealing money to me. It's, it's, 
it's, it's, it's, I, I go into the classroom and I have way too much fun for somebody who's working and drawing a paycheck. That's terrific. When you came back, did you join any military reserves or any veterans organizations? Not in, no, not, not at all. Um, Why? I, I, I was almost going to go into um, the Vietnam Veterans Association, um, but they were Vietnam vets. Uh, these were guys who, in my first job, Operation Homecoming, bringing POWs back, these were the guys who had served in country. Um, and I was a Vietnam era veteran. Uh, unlike the other wars, uh, Vietnam time period is separated by three different kinds of veterans. You had the combat veterans, who are the ones we see every day. These are the Vietnam vets. They're combat guys. They're the guys that went into the jungles. Uh, and then there are the um, uh, in-country veterans, who are the support guys. And they were the ones who uh, were always there for the guys, the combat guys come back. And then there are the Vietnam era veterans like me, who never were in country, but were in during the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. And we wore the uniform, um, but we're not Vietnam veterans. So you differentiate yourself. So we just, you know, and we would go in, um, and I would, I would go into some of these Vietnam veterans meetings uh, and associations, but I never felt part of the Vietnam veteran group. Mm -hmm. um, so then I went and tried to join um, the VFW, and most of those guys were, once again, either combat guys or they were World War II guys. Mm -hmm. And they would go in there, and there was always that tight camaraderie with the World War II guys mm -hmm. that um, they were all unit-based. They would go in as a group, serve as a group, come out as a group. Uh, but I had never done that in my career. And I would always, submariners, we were always, we were never unit based, we we're always individuals. Uh, so I never felt comfortable there either. Mm -hmm. um, then I tried the American Legion um, and didn't fit in there either. Um, so I'm. You should start your own group. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I'm. I'm Big on education, uh, partially because of my background, partially because of what the military's done for me. And uh, I'm working at Mass Bay Community College and Rhode Island College and putting together a student veterans organization. Uh, I'm working with Dave Joslin here at Mass Bay and uh, we're putting together a veterans club and, and emphasizing that veterans do have a lot of skills and a lot of things that they can transfer into educational opportunities and really pushing education hard uh, for the veterans groups. Uh, and many veterans don't self-identify. Uh, they'll go through life and just not talk about their service very much. Um, but they need to. And now, you obviously used no, I shouldn't say obviously. You, have you used veterans benefits, GI Bill, or anything of that nature? Did you use the GI Bill for I, those? I did. Uh, you know, thanks to the veterans uh, and thanks to the American taxpayers, <laughs> I ended up getting two bachelors, a master's, two masters, uh, and a PhD um, using GI Bill benefits. Um, bought my, bought uh, our first house with GI Bill benefits, mm -hmm. and uh, now use uh, the VA hospital and the VA clinics uh, for all my medical. So I'm very thankful for uh, veterans and veterans affairs. How important do you feel serving in the military was? Absolutely important. In what way? Um, it, it made me, it transformed me from a person who was undisciplined uh, who had no real emphasis on education and training. Uh, I went to college only because I could. Uh, my parents never had much education. Um, so I went there with a cocky attitude, UConn, and you know, got a 1.6 my first <laughs> semester uh, because I didn't appreciate it. Uh, and 
the fact that um, even even when I first traveled, I really didn't appreciate uh, self-discipline. Mm -hmm. And I walk out of there now as, as a veteran with a greater sense of importance of the country, uh, a greater belief in that our government is good. Problems, but good. Um, and we do strive to do good, which is why I teach American government now, why I teach American history. Um, and an incredible sense of self-confidence without being cocky. I can do just about anything, um, but not with a sense of bravado. And it's interesting you say that because in the beginning you were saying you couldn't, you weren't mechanically inclined and that's what you wanted to learn. Right. And at the end you were saying, I have nothing, I don't know what I can do with my life after I've retired and yet look at what you've done. Yeah. Looking back on all of this, are there any memorable experiences that really stick out in your career? Operation Homecoming. Bringing the POWs Bring back. Bringing POWs back. Um, it was there that I developed a real sense, you know, I'd, I'd had a twinge of patriotism, like I said mm -hmm. in the beginning. You know, I, you, you know, I, I really need to serve, but I don't know what, where, why, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and bringing the POWs back, uh, some of these guys have been POWs for five, six, seven years. Um, and seeing those guys, and bringing them back, rehabilitating them, working with them, reuniting them with their families. Operation Homecoming gave me that sense of purpose. And these guys, every one of them, every one of them, after they were rehabilitated and we took care of the medical, they all opted to stay in the service and they all opted to continue to serve. Every one of them. And it's those guys that I constantly remind myself that um, American government, American history, with all of its flaws, all of its problems, um, does a lot of good stuff. Mm. And it's, it's that plus the ability to do just about anything, I think that's... That's probably my most memorable because it's, it really was, it really gave me that sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that Master Chief, I'll never forget that guy. Are you at liberty to tell us his name? Uh, GMGC, Gunners Make Guns Chief Master Bloomingdale. He was, a, he was a mean son of a gun. And yet, he was obviously watching you he and was. knowing that you could do so much more. Do you think? You know, talking with you, Joe, and, and, and going, because I, I, I've never done this and, and rehashed my whole career like this, mm -hmm. uh, but hearing myself talk about that guy, um, for years all I remember is that guy just, he was like 5'5", five, five, and he would just grab you and just pull you down because he wanted to look at you eyeball to eyeball and, and he'd make you squat, you know, just to look him in the eye. And, and he had these yellow teeth and these three warts on his head and he'd reek of this tobacco because he wouldn't smoke, he just chewed the cigars. Mm -hmm. And so he'd reek of that and he would just, he would, he would physically push you and he would just wake you up in the middle of the night by dragging you out of your bunk and telling you to get back there and do some work. But he always took the time to train you and teach you. And you never really appreciated that at the time. Looking back, you do. But looking back, you really do. This guy, in his own way, mm -hmm. uh, really gave me that self-discipline, that self-confidence, that, that ability to learn, that desire to learn, even though he made fun of you the whole time. Did you ever run into him once you kind of became his equal? After I became a chief, 
Um, I did look him up. Um, and he was retired and he was living out in Portland, Oregon. And when I was, uh, after I became an officer, I'd send him a couple of letters and, you know, we sent a couple of letters back, but it was very perfunctory. Um, but then when I became an officer and I was on the Nevada and we brought the submarine out to Bangor, Washington, I made a special trip down there to see him. Um, and I took my officer's uniform off and I put my chief's uniform on. Out of respect for him. Yeah. Mm. Was there any humorous experience that you'd like to share with us? Oh, well, there's all kinds of funny things that we did on the submarine. You know, we played jokes on each other, and and um, you know, it would uh, they had this one? Uh, my crew, um, they I was a coffee I was a coffee junkie. Um, I'd drink 20 cups of coffee a, a day easily, easily, and. Uh, Went out to sea one time, and my I was an officer at the time, and uh, my chief said, you know, you drink way too much coffee. He said, even for a chief, you drink way too much coffee. <laughs> and uh, so he said, we're, we're gonna we're gonna cut you off a of coffee. And uh, they would only serve me hot water, no coffee, cold turkey, cut up. And and I'd get up on watch, and I'd be shaking, and my eyes would get blurry, and I'd captain to come up and he'd have to get me off watch and because I would just it I just didn't look right and they they finally the the chief got the corpsman and they strapped me down on my bed for three days and gave me an IV and and uh, just put me on some some saline solution just to wean me off of coffee uh, but I'd always get these guys coming by and it would be my whole division they would come by every day and, uh, and at least once an hour, they come by with a cup of coffee. And they would just take a sip of it, and they'd just look at me and just laugh. And I'd be in my bunk, and I'd, they'd just walk by. And it was just, it was just those kinds of things that we did to each other on board the submarine. It just built that camaraderie, but it was just great fun. Do you drink coffee today? I do. <laughs> <laughs> but nowhere near 20 cups. As we finish this up, are there any thoughts, incidents, or any comments that you'd like to share with not only your family who hopefully will be watching this but others from um, all around who will want to re review and view this DVD after we get it all together. You know there's, there's uh, a couple of things. Uh, my my uh, wife who served with me for 22 years in the military um, she had a deep understanding of what the military was all about, uh, partially because of her dad, but also because of what we went through. Uh, my new wife um, never served in the military, never knew anybody who served in the military, so has no idea um, what the military life is like. And she sees it more as over-regimentation, over-control, and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and many people see the military as this, you know, your hardcore regimentarian, you know, rigid discipline, that kind of stuff. Um, and I just want to tell all those people that that's not what it, that's not what it's about. It's not about regimentation. It's not about discipline. It's about uh, finding yourself for one. Um, it's about meeting people that you're going to go through some incredible uh, times with, good and bad. Uh, and it's, a, it's about recognizing that everyone has something to offer. And, and you've all, you're all there for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're there to figure out who you are. And number two, you all have this twinge of service and that twinge of service becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and it and you realize that it's it's not bigger and bigger and bigger it's always there and you're just finding that there are some people in the world that just have this desire to serve public service and that's what it's about 
Well, Gary Donato, we want to thank you for your public service and your service not only to your family and friends, but to your country. Thanks for this interview. Thank you.